Welcome to the Walk Around Podcast. Our goal is to share with you the insights, the skills, the processes, and the leaders that are influencing the retail automotive landscape today. I'm one of your hosts, Nick Funch. Excited to be with you today. As always, joined by Danny Vendrell. What's up, Danny? How's it going, Nick? Good to see you. Go always good to see you. Super excited today. We have an awesome guest, Brian Kramer. Hey, Brian, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for uh, having me on the show. Yeah, we're we're super glad you're here. Brian is um, a general manager with the Germain Automotive Group, um, Germain Toyota in Naples, Florida, to be specific. He's responsible. Now, just give me a minute so we can talk through this. <laughs> responsible for leading the dealership's digital transformation of transformation initiative, uh, working to eliminate traditional dealership pain points that cause unnecessary friction in transactions. He's a recipient of Automotive News Top 40 Under 40, has worked in all variable operations positions. Um, His experience as a general manager covers 19 years and a diverse set of franchises, Lexus, Chevrolet, Mercedes-Benz, Cadillac, and Toyota stores. Uh, An extensive experience, experience piloting Various digital retailing tools with CDK, Carnal, Vin Solutions, Southeast Toyota, uh, and Prodigy. And one of the things I want to definitely explore today is his team's leading the way in a 100% paperless transaction, um, which I don't think is aspirational. I think you're there or pretty damn close, uh, Brian. So love to get into that. But um, let's take a walk around today with Brian Kramer. So, um, Brian, I guess maybe let's start there. Paperless transactions, what are your thoughts? How are you approaching that? Are you there? We are there. Now, from the customer standpoint, it's one perspective. Yep. From the associate standpoint, it's another, well, from the variable associates, the salespeople, the sales managers, finance managers. And then from the accounting standpoint or compliance, it's a whole nother conversation. Yeah. And connecting all those dots is, is a hell of a challenge. And I thought it, you know, we first delivered the first one, I think it was just March of 2020, that was paperless. I thought we landed on the moon yeah. and realized that that was just the beginning because now you got to get back. And right. the accounting department goes, hey, this is great, but where's the, uh, you know, where's, where are all our packs and how are we supposed to build this deal and rip this deal? I go, well, it's all on the computer. And they go, <laughs> where? We, you know, so we had just scanned it. I just wanted to get it in there. Yeah, but there's a, a whole nother project behind the scenes that I completely never, you know, I completely underestimated where do you have to take the compliance pack, title pack, desking pack, the bank pack, all the things that they do. I basically, you know, learned that part of the business because they never worked in accounting and how much friction we had been causing. I had been causing that for two decades uh, unknowingly. I just always thought that it was, you know, well, they're just. <laughs> yeah, everybody's got issues, but but we really were. So really cleaning up their streamlined business allows them to innovate as well. Well, it's it's amazing that you you kind of start with that um and and kind of distilling down what I heard there. It's like, hey, we solved this pain point out on the sales floor that was kind of um uh created some efficiency both for the customer and for the kind of sales staff, but then we created another friction point for the office. And I think looking at change management, whatever it is, it could be paperless, could be a digital retailing tool, could be whatever. It's kind of understanding the bigger ecosystem. Is that fair? Oh, yeah. And and the crazy thing was, is that we were able to deliver the whole car, do the, the front part of the deal with the salespeople, which there's so much pushback, so much resistance. Why are we doing this? Why is it, why do we have to do all this change? Are we really going to sell any more cars? Is this going to, what is, what is the point? And yeah. then we got there and since I hadn't figured that out, the only choice I had was to print all the paperwork that wasn't printed <laughs> for accounting right. to build a deal, which oh, eliminated all the paper savings, the inefficiencies, the we do all that just to print it. So yeah. now we're past the printing on the backside, which was a massive overhaul. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, the, you know, it's um, and and you learn through those things. And I'm certain you have plenty of stories of kind of learning through the evolution of kind of um digital retailing. I'm curious what kind of drives your um, your focus and, and what's your kind of passion around kind of this paperless transaction or digital retailing as a whole? Like, what, what are some of your thoughts there? So I guess it's easier to articulate that now than it would have even been two years ago because I didn't know what to call it. But it's kind of like a blockchain approach where okay. 
one one piece leads to another piece and leads to another piece. And instead of having all this manual intervention and all this intuition and what do I think about this and having salespeople getting all these different answers, is having massive clarity around what it should be based on a probability. Maybe it's not 100 percent, but 80 percent of the time it should be this, like any other business. And like Jeff Bezos says, the best process. And I've had process manuals and books and all this <laughs> SOPs. The best process is the one that just works where you don't need that. You know, you don't get a one with your iPhone. There's no right. user manual. It's just intuitive and it works. And that was the end goal for was to make it intuitive, not just for the customers, but for the salespeople, for the finance managers, the sales managers, so that I don't have to have all these, you know, all the stress that why don't they do it this way? You know, cause it's either I didn't provide enough clarity or it's not simple enough. And typically it's a little bit of both. Yeah, I love the um, I love that word clarity. I love that word from kind of a leadership development standpoint because it, it, I've always kind of tried to think through. Um, and Danny, I'd be curious and to get your thoughts around this, but I, I've tried to think about: Hey, if you want to understand if your team is has clarity of mission, like go ask them what's important. Like just ask them, hey, what's important? And if you're getting mixed responses, if or if you're getting kind of um, some muddy or, or ambiguity through some of those answers, then you got an opportunity as a leader to kind of instill that clarity, whether it's a process, whether it's a mission, whether it's any of those things. Danny, any thoughts kind of there? Yeah. I mean, it sounds like, and, and we mentioned earlier on, on the pod that hundred percent paperless transactions. And we even just said like the change management associated with that. And so something I'm curious about, and that's one example, Nick, like from a leadership perspective, how do you you know, get the temperature of, of the team and what's going on around. But I'm curious, Brian, from your perspective as the leader in the store, what did that journey look like? You knew that, uh, you know, kind of the promised land was 100% paperless and that's where you wanted to be. And that was the end goal. And, and obviously there were so many steps in between, you know, maybe where you started and, and what that looks like today. And from a leadership perspective, if there's a dealer listening to this, that maybe that's their end goal too, but they're earlier in the journey. What, what would you say to them? Okay, so you guys are asking some pretty good questions today. <laughs> so, I mean, we, it's the 15th of the month we brought our A game. Right? <laughs> I would say, because so, you're really making my, my brain work here. <laughs> so, I've been trying to do a lot of this stuff for a very long time, at least a decade. And when I was at other dealerships, either I had a team that was starting to go in that direction and then they got promoted or they went somewhere else. But I will say this humbly, I have, I've never had the team that I have now, and I would put them up against anybody else in the world. And on period, yeah. luxury, domestic, they're, they're amazing. And they keep me freed up to be able to, like you said in the intro, to work on the digital transformation. If I'm getting hijacked because they're like my left tackle, you know, Wendell Hardy, my general sales manager, doesn't let anything get to me. And it's and Brian Weeben and everybody, all my the rest of the management team, my service director does an insane job of keeping me freed up to be able to accelerate all this. And that's I guess what didn't happen before is I didn't have the team around me that with role clarity where they knew mm -hmm. what they were supposed to do, and only if they did what they're supposed to do would I be able to do this for them. And then they have to want it, and they have yeah. to really be bought into the vision. And to answer the question, the way we did it was we process mapped it, and we took different scenarios and, and really would we kept on getting pieces of it. How do we handle the site and scene appraisal? And there were little elements of it, but when it really came together was when COVID hit. Yeah. And we had enough downtime to sit around, whiteboard it. What do we want it to look like from start to finish? Every single square on a process map and the whole customer journey. And then compare that below to what does our current journey look like? And you'll see these wide varying gaps in terms of friction pain points. And, I, and I've got you know seven clear ones that we went through. And you can only attack one at a time. And you can't attack, you can't boil the ocean going after all seven of them. Yeah. So I would just sit down with, you know, with, and you got to have some downtime. You got to have some, you can't do it when you're working 20 car deals. It's yeah. got to be done remotely somewhere else where they can really think. And some of the best answers came from our leadership team, yeah. not from me. So did you take kind of the your core leadership team offsite or in the store? And it sounds like you kind of sequestered them in the room for a little bit and, and kind of said, for hey. For a long time. Yeah, for a long <laughs> time and said, hey, let's kind of map out. And, and did you start like with the end state, what you wanted to look like? Did you start with, hey, let's map out our current state? What, 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 what? So we started off with what we wanted to look like at the end. Okay. And that's easy to do. You know, yeah. you want the customer to be able to get online, click, pick out the car they want 
submit their credit, appraise their trade, do everything pretty seamlessly, end to end. If they want to pick out some F&I products, research them at least, and then they can come in and do curbside pickup during COVID. And yeah. it, it works like that. Yeah. So I said, okay, now let's map out what it is today. Right. And that's a humble, humbling experience. <laughs> Even when you just performed the first exercise, right. is to go back through, okay, let's stop at selecting a vehicle because mm-hmm. that was where we were at. Because if the car's not in stock, the whole rest of the, of the workflow doesn't work. Right. So that took weeks. Right. Then, then the trade appraisal. So that the, the technology in the process is actually the easy part. The hard part is getting everybody within the culture to agree on what's the best way to do it. Yeah. So we're going to give them a consistent number. No, I want to ballpark it. I want to leave a range. No, I'm going <laughs> to tell them this. And then when you, the more managers you have, the more daylight you have and the more consensus you need to achieve and the longer that it takes. Mm-hmm. So each, we had the process knocked out, you know, in a month. Right. It was getting all of us to actually believe it because it's easy to sit in a room. It's easy to go to church on Sunday and say, oh yeah, I'm, you know, that's me. But then during the week is really what, who you are. And anytime that we got put in a tough situation, well, this customer doesn't do this. This guy's trying to get to his unit bonus. This is a right. unique situation. I know that we don't, don't normally do this, but, and then just having everybody that none of us are going to be the weak link in the chain. That's the hardest part. Yeah. It's interesting. Like the, you know, those exceptions end up becoming the rule a little bit, right? And you, you invest so much time, energy, resources, money to kind of do, to, to get the, the ball rolling, right? And once you kind of have that momentum, those exceptions are what kind of slow that momentum down a little bit. Um, as you reflect back kind of on that, that journey, um, it maybe just thought, were there really any kind of like, like light switch moments that, that you had, that the team had, where you kind of like looked at each other and were like, wow, it's, it's coming together. I mean, do you recollect any of those? Yes. We, we had a customer that went all the way through the process and uh-huh. well, there was a, a couple. So when, when they said we could do digital tag and titles, okay. I'm like, wow, okay, wow, figured this out. Which is <laughs> yeah. Another story <laughs> called up CDK. I said, Hey, I just need you to help me out with this and this and this. And they, they said, well, what? We didn't think anybody was going to, okay, then we need to go buy this, acquire this other company because we're not ready for that. And yeah. we had that on the back burner. We didn't think anybody would get there that quick. So they had to go perform a, a third party acquisition, which is now sign anywhere in okay. order to implement that. And we were almost going too fast. And, and then we did a video, put it on uh, you know, social media, yeah. thinking somebody else is already doing it as well. And, and it was a crazy response. And, that's when the whole leadership team were like, wow, you know, I haven't seen anybody else doing it yet. We must yeah. be that far out ahead of everybody. That's awesome. Right. And, and so you realize kind of there was this appetite or consumer demand and, um, and it's, it's awesome to kind of the foresight. So then so, we, we found yeah. out how much consumer demand there was. Right. Because we started having customers just try to, you know, cause a lot of customers haven't bought a car in 10 years yeah. and they're used to buying stuff off Amazon. They're used to buying, you know, their food on DoorDash and all those other things that we just take for granted today, curbside pickup at Walmart and Target, because it's been such a slow, gradual transition. Mm-hmm. But car business, it hasn't been. It's the vertical that's untouched, right? Or hotel industry. And these customers were starting to go all the way through and they were putting deposits on the cars and we hadn't finished the workflow yet. So oh, wow. the customers are coming in, where's my car? It's not curbside. We weren't explaining the next steps and what they could expect workflows on what manage how, how do the managers manage they were managing 80 percent of our management staff was looking at the front door but 80 percent of our activity was coming in the back door so our our staffing was misaligned so as these people are putting deposits down we're trying to find the deposits and i don't know where they're at because it's apple pay and it's and accounting goes i don't know where that goes so i had to call my digital stripe <laughs> you know yeah. element where do i get this money from does it well i don't know you haven't integrated it with your you know, your bank account yet. Okay. How do I do that? And everything was like that. So yeah. the customers wanted to go way faster than we do. we still can't keep up with it. There's so much in the, what do they say? In the last 12 months, e-com sales and automotive have gone from 1% to 10%. It's amazing. And yeah, and it, that you look at the trajectory of what it did back in the nineties with, with overall e-commerce, if it's anything like that trend, it's going to be tsunami. So how are you preparing for kind of that tsunami? So 
now it's about fine tuning. It's about just minimizing the friction points. And really, you've got to have a certain margin of spillage. And no differently than in, in, with J and A. Obviously, you sell service contracts, but X amount of cars are going to break. You're right. going to have to pay out some money. It's not just you get to keep it all. And right. it's the same thing with this is that if there's a 5% area, you know, variance and errors or everything's not perfect, when you look at everything from a scalability standpoint, we're going to lose money on some cars at the auction, make money some, on some cars at the auction. And we have to be willing to take those variances like Amazon does with returns yeah. and be okay with 5% errors here and error to not slow down because the funnel that comes down of, okay, now you got this many people want to praise cars. And this many people that will appraise cars, empowering the sales staff to decentralize retail, decentralize appraisals, enable uh, salespeople to be able to pencil deals, which we're doing, mm -hmm. enable them to certain certain you know minimum standards, whatever. But with clarity, uh, we're having success with it. And really, the problem is is you got to trust your people more and more these days. Enable them, empower them, and with, I find that with the proper expectations, they do what you ask them to do. Yeah. The problem is, is that they typically aren't providing enough clarity of how to do the job. We just tell them what not to do, what not what they should be doing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and so how do you, I guess I'm, I'm curious, do you handle kind of, uh, you talked about that 80%, 20% and kind of the sales managers, kind of in theory, they're watching that front door versus kind of the, the, the back door. How do you handle that kind of in-store transact? Do you handle it differently than the, the kind of customer that starts online? Do you try to give them the same experience? So regardless of how they they start the genesis of it, mm -hmm. it's interesting you say that. So there is no, I think last month we sold, you know, under 600 cars. Okay. And there was five people that could, that went completely end to end. Okay. It's rare. And at some yeah. point, we still have to call them and, and get involved. But right. It's not as bad as the washer and dryer that my wife and I bought last night locally. And we tried to buy it online. I could have bought it out of New Jersey easier. I could buy it here locally. Crazy. And I, it said buy now. I hit, but we're, I mean, the auto industry is not far off from what I'm saying. We hit buy now. And it said a, uh, a representative will, will be in contact with you at some point tomorrow. Yeah. You know, so I've got to work today. <laughs> my wife's running around. She's like, so we don't have a dryer that works. Are we going to have it tomorrow? Are we? So she keeps shopping. But right. She doesn't know because they're not omni-channel. So at the Apple store, if I order it online, I can go pick it up in the store. If I buy it in the store, it's not in stock. They'll ship it to my house. They'll do whatever it is that, you know, it's more convenient for me to get the product. And we do the same thing here. So there's no, we've got some people that handle internet leads as a specialty. We don't have a BDC for sales. Yeah, we've got twelve people on the service drive that are working equity mining uh, mm -hmm. to try to get us. They sourced one hundred and twenty-seven cars last month for us, so wow. we don't have to go to the auction. Yeah. Obviously, you know that deal right now. Yeah, for sure. And then <clears throat> we've got six people that are, you know, taking showroom ups, and that's in new cars, and it's about the same setup and used. Yeah, and we've got one person desking deals for the whole building. Wow, wow! Because there's there's role clarity as to what they're supposed to come up to the desk with, and they've got two managers that are setting appointments, who's specifically focused on appraisals, but everybody's role is clear and nobody's doing anybody else's job. So you have no diffusion of responsibility. So everybody knows they have to do their job. Yeah. What's well, in those, like that blockchain theory, right? Those, all those building blocks build upon each other, right? Um, throughout that entire process. So uh, Danny, I know you've been itching to jump in here. What, what are your thoughts? That's something I'm, I'm curious about, Brian. We talked about this transformation uh, over the past couple of years. And we talked about you know, mapping out the customer journey and role alignment and providing enablement for, for the folks that work in the store. And I think that's all awesome and, and, and such an interesting story. Something I'm curious about is uh, from your perspective, the culture of, of the store and something we, we think about a lot and we hear about a lot is obviously, you know, turnover. And that's a challenge in our industry as a whole, retention and, and, and building up a winning culture in the store. Um, and I'm curious your perspective as, as um, a leader that went through this transformation and has you know your eyes ahead in the future from a retention and associate experience and culture perspective, what things are on your mind? Okay, so that's the most important thing. 
Okay. And that's the biggest differentiator. Um, because I think that I'm blessed. I got Jared Kilway who's our, our chief digital guy and he is able to connect. And we could have, wouldn't have been able to connect all this stuff about him or without the managers keeping us freed up, but it's the culture that we're all aligned towards a common vision and a common purpose. And in March of last year, we changed our tagline, which that was another thing that, not, that we all didn't agree on. So we're going to get away from price and payment because it seemed inappropriate at the time to keep on hammering when everybody, with, with all this uncertainty was going on to start talking about discounts as much as this, payments as low as this. It seemed insensitive. So we just stopped advertising price at that point and payments, and we haven't advertised it since. We've got prices listed online, but we don't do it on television or any any social media campaigns. We only advertise simple, fast, easy. Yeah. And it's best a challenge, but that's kind of the, the beacon or the lighthouse, the, the North star that everybody's looking at. So now we use it as a decision tree, any decision that we make, if we add this vendor, is it going to make the process more, you know, simpler, faster, and easier? And if it doesn't, it's a no, even as tempting as it is, if this associate is a high powered F and I get, runs big numbers and they, or a salesperson that's selling 30 cars a month, but they're not aligned with our core values. We, we all got together. We said, we're not going to be aligned with this and they can't be on the team, no matter how successful they are. And we yeah. lost a few, you know, very talented, very, some of the top 10 performers in uh, jm and in the nation. Yeah. And that was a, almost a nauseating experience to, uh, to make that decision, but it was the right decision because we're still, now we're more profitable. Everybody's aligned towards winning and they're aligned towards the person next to them winning. So we brought in the culture coach from Ohio State, uh, Tim Kite, who worked for Urban Meyer, yeah. and actually brought the whole management team. And it was pretty expensive, but it was it was worth its weight in gold because now the management team is is aimed in the right direction, and they're focused mainly on eradicating BCD, which is what they say at Ohio State, which is blame, complain, and defend. Mm -hmm. And they said it's what the, the most toxic thing in, in organizations, and it's one of the most tolerated in the auto industry is listening to other people blame you know others why things can't happen defend you know their or complain about circumstances or defend why things are the way they are or defend why their situation is unique like we talked about earlier and it's it's human nature to do those things so it's a muscle that has to be developed to resist going there and it's a daily habit and they also say it's either a you either go above the line or below the line Mm -hmm. We passed on a deal the other day, a very profitable deal where the customer wasn't telling us what they were doing with their trade. We are assuming that it's not going to be anything good with the lender. Mm -hmm. and they didn't. They said, just kick the trade. Don't worry about it. And that that's not something we're willing to participate in. And everybody yeah. says that I said it for a long time, but we just flat out, we put our own caps on what we'll sell products for the most amount of reserve, not because any government agency is making us just because we decided it's, you know, there's no right way to do the wrong thing as Wendell, my GSM says, yeah. and living that is one thing. Cause it used to be at other dealerships. I worked at at five o'clock, I would walk out the door and I didn't know, or I would hear stories that, that Hey, don't worry about what Kramer said. This is a $10,000 deal. You know, we're doing this. I don't we'll deal with the backlash tomorrow, but it's not like that anymore. They want the same thing that I want, which is to, to give a world-class customer experience and we make it up in retention and, and it's, and it's working, you know, everybody's up the market, the wind's at our back, but we're doing it a lot more profitably with less brain damage for the associates and the customers, which is the key. You can sit there and firefight all day long, but with self-inflicted gunshot wounds and you can triage it, and, you know, think you're, that you're a hero, but I really want these guys to have work-life balance. I want them to leave when they're supposed to, I don't want them to have to worry about their days off and, and have to come here with all the anxiety that I did for the first 20 years of my career. Because yeah. it's unnecessary. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think um, there's a lot of, I'm reflecting on just our conversation today, Brian. And I think like the, it's one thing to say those things, right. And you, I think you made the comment earlier about you can sit in church on Sunday, but how you live in the rest of the week kind of thing. Um, but it's all about kind of how you live those things. And um, I think kudos to you, for your leadership, um, kudos to the team, I think, because reality is, is you're proving that kind of uh, making it a priority um, certainly pays a dividend, uh, both in your people and your business and that in with your customers. And so um, 
So thank thank you for yeah. being with us today, Brian. I think you got a great story and um, this conversation has been great. I, I guess, Danny, I would ask you, what'd you take out of today's conversation that, that's going to stick with you? I mean, it was, it was awesome. I love hearing um, just this, this under the hood story of, of transforming a business and, and working towards this consumer experience. I think we all um, see the industry uh, heading in that direction. I think I love the kind of practical idea of, Hey, let's get the team, lock them in a room and we are, we're going to map out what's, what's our vision for the future look like? Where are we winning? Where are we losing? Where can we build towards what this vision looks like? And I think that's something that we could all do. Um, and, and it works for, for big uh, transformations like this and maybe even smaller um, roadblocks that you may have on a, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. I, I love that, that practical, practical approach. I'll say this, it wasn't all while, and it still isn't. We're, we're still miles away. We're maybe 20% of the way there. It wasn't all lollipops, rainbows, and unicorns. Yeah. But but one of the things that was was good and bad is that, you know, I've, I now have a level of trust with my management team. And I know I sound like a broken record, but due to the fact that they're so amazing, and I know they're not going to be perfect, they also know I'm not going to be perfect. Yeah. And probably half the ideas that I brought up, they said, Brian, you're <laughs> that's that's really out yeah. there. You're right. I would say, okay, so tell me why. So probably half of the things that I wanted to do never happened. You know, like I wanted, I said, you know, if I go to Dick's Sporting Goods and all these other uh, big box retailers, Best Buy, they have a price match guarantee and it looks like this. So why can't we do this? Because we shouldn't really, you know, all of our people have a word track. They have, we just don't know what it is, but they, they have a go-to. Right. And they just don't tell us when they come to the desk. And the management team all aligned. And I initially said, well, that's just because you guys want to, you know, you don't want to take those deals, right. but it wasn't that. And they said, well, shouldn't we generate a lot more activity if we're doing simple, fast and easy? If that's the halo, why do we also have to do price? Right, that's not the goal. If the goal is right. just to provide the most hassle-free experience, why don't we just hang our hat on that and try not to be everything to everybody? So that's, they were right. And I, I said, I can't argue with that, but you've got to, as a, you know, I, I, didn't, I haven't always worked for leaders that allowed me to have to offer that type of feedback. It was yeah. more of a one-way conversation. And half of, well, they have more good ideas than I do. And now they've taken it to another, because it's their idea. And they've had success with it. They've helped carve it out. And they're taking it to a level that I would never have taken it to. And if you're not willing to honestly listen to the feedback, it doesn't mean you're going to change everything right then and there. But they're in it. They're dealing with the customers. They know what the realities are. And sometimes you get a stand on stuff. There was, I kept saying that we needed to use, uh, we're going completely digital. And if you don't, if you keep printing forms, you know, they have all these different reasons that were yeah. easier. So I just deleted called CDK and I deleted all the forms. Right. And it's like $800 a form to put those back in. And yeah. I, I said, so I'm not putting them back in. There's no other way to do it. And then, and then it was hundred percent six Sigma. There was no right. other way to get it done. Right. And that's when it that's when it truly took and so there's a balance between the first example and the second example. And a leader's got to know when to dig in on the second one and got and know know when to give in on the first analogy because I was definitely wrong more than I was right along the way. And I needed them to talk some sense into me. And if if uh if I if, if we didn't have that level of trust and clarity and they hadn't seen before that I would take their input and if their idea is better than mine, which many times it is, and implement it, then they stop offering up their opinions. And that's yeah. a ma major point. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that um, you're, you, it's, it's a, a snowball effect, right? When, when you're getting that feedback, it's just information, right? At the end of the day, it's kind of what you do with that information. Um, and, and if somebody's kind of um, either sharing, hey, this is, why it will or why it won't, or um, or you're able to take somebody's great idea and implement it, and they can see the results. They're that much at more likely to give you better ideas and better input. And, um, man, there's a lot of lessons I think in all of that from um, just leadership to to just treating people the right way. So um, simple, fast, and easy. A, right? There was another they were praising cars. They made a few mistakes, and I said, "Do not let the customers appraise their own cars." Yeah. And they're like. You know, I said, then I'm also going to let the salespeople appraise their cars. So the same look that you have was the same yeah. look that my managers had. And I said, <laughs> okay, so yeah, let's talk this through. And I, 
had it quantified. I said, you know, we make mistakes X amount of the time. I've sent these appraisals to customers. They make it about the same amount of the time. So now it just comes down to how much more could we get done if all we had to do was just verify what the customers did. If the customers appraised their cars like a self-check out at a grocery store and yeah. you had them doing somebody else's job, how much more can you scale and get done by not and less headcount that you need? Because now you're just inspecting and checking instead of, which is now all the managers do, instead of having to do input, take the pictures, all those things. The salespeople and the, and the customers are taking the pictures now. So how much less... <laughs> They can they can confirm more appointments, coach, develop, mentor, all the things instead of having to be so task based. So even though that thing, you know, that the suggestion sounded, you know, insane initially, even to you, yeah. those are the kind of ideas that allow you to really take off. Well, I laugh because the if you know if you look at some of the online retailers. Um, you know, they all do it, right? You can you can put in your VIN, put in your license plate number, answer a couple questions, give them your email address, and they'll throw you back a number, right? Um, right. And as long as, and the reality is, is when if, if you proceed down that sales funnel, they're not going to reevaluate your car. They're just going to validate what you told them is accurate, that there are two sets of keys, that there's a sunroof and all that good stuff. Um, and then they're going to move down the road. And um, I think that perfectly aligns with with your tagline. So, uh, Brian, this has been awesome. I know where where can our listeners find you just to kind of keep track, keep a pulse of kind of what you got going on. I'm on LinkedIn under Brian Kramer, Twitter uh, Kramer Brian. I'm on uh, Clubhouse, okay. Facebook, uh, all, YouTube under Brian Kramer. Cool. Well, in uh, Jermaine Toyota in Naples, look them up. They got a lot of great things going on. Um, we'll make sure to link to um, how they can contact you in the show's notes. And if you liked this uh, episode, be sure to share it with your friends, pass it along. Give Brian um, a shout out so uh, he knows, knows you heard him. And then be sure to let us know what other guests or other topics you'd love us to explore. So, um, Brian, thank you again for your time. Until next time, this is the Walk Around Podcast. Have a great day.